to uh, give a brief background on me and some company highlights and some words of wisdom. Uh, I think it's very interesting to talk about me as a person, so I'll just like, really go through that quickly, and then you guys can ask me about it. Uh, the other thing I'd like to do is give a very quick overview of the company, but I'm not going to spend too much time on that because I really want to focus today on the leadership issues or the kind of uh, the nuggets of wisdom, if you will. And I try to grab those nuggets, and I don't know if they are nuggets, so if you guys help me out. So um, I grew up in this area. I uh, grew up in the Beaverton, Portland area since I was nine years old. Uh, I studied physics at the University of Washington as an undergrad. Uh, did my uh, master's in electrical engineering here. My MBA here while I was running my company, which I started in 1995. Um, I come from a family of entrepreneurs, uh, so entrepreneurship wasn't really a new idea for me, uh, but it was just more of a matter of when. Um, my hobbies uh, were things that uh, have been very influential in my life. Uh, I love to ski, uh, I like to play golf, I love cars, uh, and uh, I've been uh, a martial artist about nine years old, although I don't get to do that as much as I like to. Uh, on the music side, I like to play from guitar, and I like to stop. Um, so that's a quick, I'm just going to go you. Let me talk about the company. Uh, VTM stands for Vital Technical Marketing. And it was in 1995 uh, when I was a um, marketing manager at uh, Intel Architecture Labs that I had an idea to go out and establish a technical marketing company. And uh, from there, uh, I added on different uh, functions and they are turned up uh, different brands and agencies. So we still have biotechnical marketing, uh, which is an initiative of the company. Also, uh, engineering technical uh, services, ETS. We have an uh, engineering test and debug tools company, so that's a product company. Uh, test lab uh, company doing engineering services. These are all different brands, believe it or not, they all very sound, sound very similar, I realize. Uh, Nereus is a PR agency, and we have a couple folks here from Nereus, one of which is an alum from here. If you guys are looking for PR jobs or for people to know, just wanted to make sure you guys get that. Um, I also uh, uh, had an opportunity to get into hospitality. Our idea of hospitality is uh, service orientation. And right now, our idea of that is a couple of restaurants, so we're kind of all kinds of different things. But the way we got into these different businesses isn't to just try to do all things. You know, ourselves, rather, we have experts that focus on different things, and that's what they do. But the reason for the VTM group concept is every company has overhead, and that overhead is generally HR, uh, IT. Um, uh, so, IT, HR, and accounting. At a, at a minimum, every company needs to have those things, and that's generally called overhead. Uh, so, the whole concept with the VTM group was that. We have centralized overhead, those kinds of those three functions. So none of the companies actually have to pay for an entire HR department or uh, an accounting department or uh, IT. Rather, they get to share it because no one really needs it all the time. And usually, it comes in peaks and valleys, and that's part of our competitive advantage that we have uh, when it comes to uh, having uh, sustaining power uh, through the good and the uh, bad of the economy. So, this is now where the leadership stuff comes in. Um, I, I want to address a couple of different things in, in, in terms of, I want to do it a little bit differently than what I think most people expect uh, someone like me to come in. You know, I'm not going to come in and talk about, you know, these are the secrets on how to run the business and make this much money and that. And that's all important, but you have to come from the right mindset. Uh, from the right attitude, and you have to have the foundational things in order uh, in your life in order to make that successful, whatever your career happens to be. And that's kind of where I'm going to get started. So, I, I'm addressing a uh, business class, so I, I ask them, you know, what do you, who do you want to be in life? Why are you here at a university and, and learning stuff and hopefully you know doing some business kind of stuff someday, right? So I encourage you to ask, okay, so who do I really want to be in life? 
is one thing that you should start with. The other would be, um, why am I here at this point in my life, and how does that relate to the rest of my life, my career, and all that stuff? And the long-term answer, so I'm going to help you cheat a little bit, and I'm going to put words in your mouth here. Um, I'd like to think that if you're anything like when I was in your position, that you're here to become an extraordinary person. Uh, you're also wanting to become a person of character, to be the pillar of your community, and to become a leader in your family or in whatever organization that you serve. Notice I said serve, right? It's, those are the things that I assume you guys are here for. Anybody not here for that? Good. And if you're not, then please change your mind and be that ideal. So, uh, the other, the way you become that is number one, um, you don't follow, don't ever follow the average and don't strive to be average. You know, because you don't want to just be average, because if you're just average, then gosh, you can do that with very little work. Uh, so you shouldn't really have to study so hard and all those things, and that's not what extraordinary is about. The other concept that I'm going to bring that's a little bit different, uh, and not everybody necessarily will agree, but and, I, and I'll couch it very carefully. And you hear of, you know, hey, you gotta take it easy, do some things in moderation, or you know, hey, you gotta do things in moderation, otherwise you're gonna kill yourself, and this and that, you know. But what I'd like to suggest is that you pick your battles, so to speak. Decide which things are really, really important to you, and take that stuff absolutely to the limit. Because moderation generates mediocre results. And if you want it to be mediocre, you wouldn't be here. Does that make sense? So I want you to think a little bit differently in terms of if something is important to you, don't just do it casually or don't say, well, gosh, I don't want to kill myself, so I'm going to kind of take it easy. Well, take it easy later. Like, you know, when you die, you can take it easy and sleep all, all your, you know. So uh, I want to encourage you guys, and you may not actually hear this very often, I want you to think moderation equals mediocre. Remember that moderation equals mediocre. So that's going to be part of the theme tonight. So to decide what things matter to you. And I want you to really think about those things that matter and take that to the absolute breaking point kind of limit. In order to do these things, um, you have to set good goals. You know, I'm not going to tell you anything terribly new there. And, but you have to also be in it for the long haul. Um, over the years, uh, I have heard of many people who are thinking, gosh, you know, yeah, I'm going to become a super rich or whatever, uh, you know, successful uh, entrepreneur, and I'm going to retire in my late 20s or early 20s, and, or in my 30s, I'm going to retire and do this and that. It's like, well, seriously, what are you going to do if you actually retired when you were 30? <laughs> you know what I mean? It's like, what are you going to do? Are you going to be like food processing, pleasure seeking machine? <laughs> right? So it's great that you strive to be very successful. It's really great that you try to take whatever it is to the limit. And I hope you guys are in a position where you can you know, have those kinds of successes. But don't make that the goal. And don't certainly make that the place where you go, OK, I'm just going to not lay on the beach. Because there's got to be more to it than that in life. And so you must be in it for the long haul. And to take something to the long haul, it, it, it takes discipline. It takes diligence and hard work. You know, kind of the stuff that some people don't think is really cool is hard work. You know, I've heard people say, well, you know, I, I don't work hard, I, I work smart. Well, that's great, but work smart and work hard, kick everybody's butt, let's go. <laughs> so again, it's that whole attitude of, yes, of course work smart. Duh, why would you not? Of course work efficiently, but work harder. Work with more diligence and you know, take it to the long haul. That's how you create a championship team, and that's how you, in your life, will actually win. So don't let people tell you, hey, be smart about it and don't work so hard. Okay, be smart about it, yes, and work so hard. So kind of keep that in mind. And also keep in mind that, you know, road to success 
Uh, and I don't mean just monetary success. Monetary success is very cool and nice and it's important, but it's also success in life as a whole package, which I'm going to talk about. Um, it, it's mentally and physically demanding. I think a lot of people uh, assume that it's mentally challenging and if you're super smart, uh, it's achievable, but I want to make sure that everybody understands it's also physically demanding and you have to be physically fit enough to endure the challenges of hard work, diligence, the long haul. Um, let me give you an example of that. Um, during my heyday of travel, which uh, started in, in the early 90s, uh, which pretty much went on until like the early 2000, uh, maybe about through about 2004, 2005, I was traveling uh, a lot. And, uh, and then uh, about 2006 or 2007, I traveled a lot less. And what I loved about travel was when I'm sitting on top of the Pacific Ocean or the Atlantic, nobody can interrupt me for about 12 hours. You know, and that was the time when I got my homework done for my MBA class. And also a lot of the company strategies and, and those things got done. If you weren't physically capable and mentally capable of pushing yourself to that limit, you'd be watching something, you know, you'd be watching a movie or you'd be sleeping. You'd be basically wasting away that time. The other thing about you know working in different time zones, you know, if you show up in Asia, there's about two hours of break. Other than that, you can work double. You can be teleconferencing into the U.S. and then you turn around, go grab a quick workout breakfast, and then you're at an 8 o'clock meeting in Asia. And so that actually makes you really productive. Sounds crazy, I realize, but if you need to do it, it can be done. And in order to be able to do that, you have to be physically capable. You know, you don't have to be all cut and buff to do it, but you've got to be in shape and not at risk of dying you know, of a heart attack or something at 25. So, Keep in mind it's mentally and physically grueling to really strive to be your best. So I just want to make sure I address that with you guys here. So let me try to boil it down to um, a couple pieces of the nugget. So it's going to seem pretty obvious at first, but then I'll explain some of the details. Um, so I, I have, let's see, I have four things. Uh, some of them may over First thing, and I'll read it out loud because it's got a lot of it. I'll read it word for word and then we can talk about it. Be an independent thinker. Nothing terribly new. But in, be an independent thinker guided by the wisdom of our most trusted sources, personal experiences, unencumbered by thinking without any pre uh, preconceived ideas or boundaries, burden at all. Don't walk in with any kind of, well, I know this to be true, so therefore, it's like, forget about that, and don't be encumbered by any of that. And be truly an independent, what a lot of people call out-of-the-box thinking. Um, I never liked that term because it's like, what are you doing in a box in the first place? <laughs> but, <laughs> so, I'd like to say, rather, think boundarylessly and be an independent thinker. And whatever you do, don't ever accept conventional and ordinary thoughts. And we're going to go into that in a little bit. The second thing is, as a leader or as a follower or any part of whatever it is, as an individual, always do the right thing. Everybody will know right here what the right thing is. Always do the right thing and do what is always right, no matter what. Even if you find that it may not support the mission, you'll know what the right thing is. And if that's the case, then figure out what is wrong and what is flawed in your mission, and then realign it. Number three is leading by example. It's character-based leadership with a lot of people. As, call, as they call it. It's also stewardship. Stewardship is the way, one way you can tell whether you're a successful steward of, of whatever it was that you were given uh, the responsibility over is, it should always be given to someone else. You should be leaving that position whenever you leave in a much better condition than when you received it. That's stewardship. 
it's not about you. It's about the collective that you represent and that relies on you to be a good steward. Number four is don't do anything, and I already said this, that's important in moderation because moderation, once again, equals Mediocre, yeah. <laughs> I just want to make sure you guys are listening. So let me now give you a couple different examples. And um, these are going to be a little bit unusual in terms of I'm not going to be talking about performance and PLs and stuff like that, which I think is an important aspect of running a business. But I'm going to be talking about stuff that is foundational to you as an individual who will participate in leading a business. So I'm going to assume you guys are someday going to be leading a, be, be leading, leading a business. And that also means that how do you take care of your part before you show up or as you are doing your job? First, you have to get yourself in order. Um, what that means is, in, in my definition, first you have to acquire a winning mindset. And then you also have to balance your life. Um, these are often... Uh, once again, there's a whole lot of conventional wisdom out there. There's like work versus life balancing act. Because that implies that if you give one thing a lot, then you're taken away from the other. And it's not true. You just need to balance a whole lot of things simultaneously, which doesn't mean that you give it you know, equal weighted attention all the time. It depends on the situation and what is going on in your life. And I'm going to talk about balancing your life, not work-life balance. Because you never say, well, I'm going to, you know, it's uh, my life versus my friends. Uh, it's not my life. If you are very successful at work, it makes your life a lot easier too. And, you know, it can be balanced in any different way. So I want to talk about that. But let's talk about the winning mindset. And it's not some formula of, you know, hey, you got to do these three things, you're going to win. But it's not necessarily that. But it's one of your own nature. Uh, one thing I've heard many times, and I've read as well, that one of the key common attributes of many successful people in the world is that they're really optimistic. Have you guys heard that? Yeah? Anybody here, you have to be super pessimistic to win? No, right? So, it's true. Optimism and positive outlook on things, your life, your, your whatever it is that you engage in, is really, really key. And what that means is, you have to refuse to accept pessimism, right? The sarcasm, the pessimism that is become kind of, you know, popular in our culture. Um, and if you're a pessimistic person by nature, then simply change it. it. I know it sounds difficult, but it's really not. And I'm going to share with you how you can do these kinds of things. And it's silly, but I'd like to ask you to try this. Trust me and try this. Tomorrow morning when you wake up, I'd like to ask you to just put a smile on your face. Just crack open a smile, even if your alarm's going off and you hit the snooze for the fifth time, you're going, oh, I really don't. Just crack a smile and see how that feels. I promise you, you will feel different. And then you simply choose to be happy and simply choose to be optimistic. You know, you're like, okay, I got my backpack full of books. It's 10 o'clock, the library closes at midnight. I got about three, four, eight hours worth of work to do. It's raining sideways. There's nothing fun about this. But, you know, put that on. Walk with a little bit of a bounce. And, you know, you see somebody that clearly is having a bad day because they look like a drowning rat because they've been in the rain going sideways. Smile and go, hi. <laughs> and then keep walking. And as you do that, it'll, it'll become a habit, and you won't be able to stop that, and that stuff becomes infectious. You know? Walk with, with this sense of, gosh, I'm so glad to be alive, even though you still have eight hours of homework and stuff to do, and it's raining sideways, and it's cold and miserable. And you'll actually start to change your nature from the inside. Hopefully you don't have to change too much, but it will insert another dose of a shot in the arm that you need. Believe it or not, this stuff actually works. And 
know, it's, it sounds really difficult and silly and outrageous, but if your nature happens to be, and you don't have to tell anybody else about it, but if it's pessimistic, choose to change it by doing these kinds of silly things. I just gave you a couple examples. Um, because if you don't, you're not going to be that much fun to be around, and no one wants to be led by a bunch of people that aren't fun to be around. Um, so that will do a couple different things. It will allow you to think clearly in the moment of crisis, to be able to figure out a way to fight your way out of the crisis in the most winning way possible, with the best solution possible. Because then you're able to say, yeah, I'm going to think my way out of this in a most positive, optimistic uh, way so that it creates a long-term kind of success. The other uh, is to balance your life. And this is going to take a little bit more time than just simply putting, cracking open a, uh, cracking a smile on your face. So let's talk about balancing your life. Um, I, I'm using very deliberate words, and it's balancing your life. It is not a one versus the other. And I simply chose to categorize them, pretty much all things in five different buckets. And you can choose different types of buckets. So this, these are the buckets that just happen to work for me. You can choose your label any which way and, and create these buckets. But you do need to create these things that you're going to balance. So bear with me here and just kind of go along with me even if you don't agree necessarily with one of these buckets because it does somehow cover the spectrum of what I call balancing your life. And this isn't necessarily in priority order, but it is the, it, these are the five things. So let's create five buckets here. There's self, you. You have to balance yourself, so to speak, or you're one of the things. So consider this big platter, and you've got these five buckets that you need to somehow balance. Self is a bucket. Family is a uh, thing that you need to balance. Friends is another category. And I'll make a distinction between the two. And spiritual pursuit is an important bucket that is often um, uh, neglected in this fast-paced world. The other is your career slash your business. So here are the five buckets. You have yourself, family, friends, spiritual pursuit, and your career slash business. So I'm going to call that career for the sake of our discussion, but it could be your business, it could be whatever you do for a living. So let me do a little bit of um, defining, and these are just it may be like uh, splitting hair, but um, let me let me give you a little bit of that here. So yourself is you want to develop yourself continually, physically, emotionally, mentally, intellectually, all those things, and um, and you have to actually be a good manager of this machine called yourself, right? I mean, you would actually go take your car to get a tune-up, or you would go get an oil change and you would put fuel and that kind of stuff. The body is easy to, you know, yourself is kind of easy to pull because even if you sort of run out of gas or it feels like it, you can still keep going. So, and you don't get these little lights blinking that force you to go do something. In order to truly get yourself in the right mindset, um, there's the physical, mental, uh, aspects of it. And your physical is, when's the last time you guys had a physical exam? I want you to think about that, and if it's been more than, say, a year, year and a half, you really need to go get that done. Um, it's, easy to, to, it's easy to neglect your physical self because you're so busy. Well, if you're this busy now, it ain't going to get any better in a few years when you've got your job, some kids, spouse, bills, and your career. So get into a habit of actually taking care of yourself. Go get a physical exam and make sure that you're proactively preventing any problems. So you have to optimize your physical self. You have to also know your limits and strengthen yourself and build endurance and those kinds of those kinds of things. The mental aspects are positive attitude, and you know physical attributes actually do have an impact on your uh, mental aspects and those kinds of things. Always advance yourself forward. Always be learning. Your degree isn't it. It's got to be more than that. After your degree is a piece of paper that's going to get you into the tournament of life and career and all that stuff. But well, once you get there, you don't you know. Stop. You gotta keep learning and you gotta keep uh, doing things that actually advance you forward. 
don't, com don't forget to decompress and rejuvenate. Engage in things that are fully engaging. One of the things that I just physically can't do very well is run on a treadmill. I just, it's like, just kill me, you know? It's like I'm looking at the wall or whatever, and this thing's running, and I'm just getting this picture of, I'm a hamster. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm on this really expensive machine, and I'm going nowhere, and I think I'm getting healthy, but mentally, I'm just going crazy. Do things that are fully engaging. I'm not saying don't run on a treadmill. I do do that, too. But do also things that will decompress your mental, physical, the whole package. Then you feel truly refreshed. So don't forget the, the fully engaging activities. So that is yourself. The other is your family. And you know most people assume when you say family, they're blood relatives or some people that you have to see in the, during the holidays. And that's kind of the definition. And my definition of family versus friends are a little bit different than that. There are those people in your life where you don't expect any reciprocal things coming back from them. You just chose that these people, they don't have to be relatives to you. They don't have to be you know, anything other than somebody that you just deeply care about and that you decided that you're just going to give and give and give, and if they kick you in the teeth, you smile and you give some more, and that's okay, and that's the kind of relationship that you chose to have for whatever reason with those people, and that's who I would call in the category of family. And in that, you have to understand your role. So you're somebody's uh, uh, son or daughter or aunt or whatever you are, understand what that ideal role would be, like, you know, picture your, yourself in this perfect, picture-perfect, you know, Norman Rockwell, whatever, movie, thing, paint. And then kind of strive to be that person in that relationship relative to those that you call family. So, strive to be those things. You'll never get there to perfect it, but you should always strive to do it. But be careful who you choose to place in the category of family because it's going to be really a big commitment. And then there are those that you call friends. That are, um, they're the people that you have an ongoing reciprocal kind of relationship, right? Uh, unlike family, if they kick you in the teeth, you're not likely to call them back. And you know, But they are people that you do things with and that you grow together and you do all those wonderful things. And also, keep in mind your friends define who you are. So be really choosy with those that you're going to consider to be friends. Believe it or not, this is all part of the grand scheme of success. Okay. Um, and be true to them, be loyal to them, all those things. And always have appropriate, appropriately reciprocating relationships with them. And that's who I would call friends. Let's talk about spiritual pursuit. Um, spiritual pursuit, key word is spiritual and it is actually a pursuit. I, I don't ever expect to get to the destination in, in my lifetime where I, you know, it just, I think it's going to be a constant struggle and I accept that, but it's one that I constantly try at and, and, and try to improve and it's a pursuit and it is a soul and mind cleansing thing that you can rely on during the happy moments and your dark moments, etc. But it is really important to have the spiritual pursuit. And, you know, I realize I'm at a Catholic school here, and I don't see any priests, so maybe we can talk about this next week. Father Jerry will kill me later. Um, let, let's talk about the spiritual pursuit, because some people declare to be either atheist or they're agnostic, right? So if you're agnostic, you know, my understanding of agnostic means that, yeah, okay, I believe that there's something of a superior being, but I'm not quite sure. And I ask, well, what are you waiting for? Do something about it, right? Go figure it out and find out and start that journey if you haven't started yet. Hopefully you guys aren't in that uh, mindset. Hopefully you already understand your God and your spiritual pursuit. Always keep that in mind. Uh, take a moment to cleanse your soul and, and feed your spiritual self. And your career and your business. Um, this is kind of an interesting one. Uh, first decide what kind of lifestyle you want. Because if your lifestyle desires conflict with what you choose as your career, you're constantly going to be in a struggle with yourself and with the other four things that you're trying to balance. So you have to really decide kind of 
bottom up, what kind of lifestyle when I'm you know, 30, 40, 50, 60, 80, whatever years old that I, I, I feel like I need to live and why? And I don't mean just toys and things like that. I mean what kind of schedule, what's important to you? And then decide on a career path that actually meets all those uh, needs. Oftentimes people get into a career that sounded really cool and then they realize, wow, I want to live like that. And then, but they still keep doing it and they're not a very balanced person as a result of that. And once you've decided and accepted these things, relentlessly go after it and all the other four buckets. And the whole idea is that, you know, I just identified five things that you can pretty much put everything about your life into, but don't assume that you're going to go, okay, uh, let's just do a quick mathematical analysis and we're going to put 20%, 20%, 20%, therefore balance, while out no problem. Because it never quite works like that. Because if you have that expectation, then you're going to be mediocre at all five. So depending on what is going on in your life, what challenges are in front of you and what you need to achieve, the weighting of that platter that contains the five things will have to shift. But it's okay as long as you understand and you deliberately, conscientiously make those choices and you tilt the weighting as you see fit. And it's a very deliberate decision that allows you to be at peace as you go to bed dead tired just so that you can get up four hours later or three and a half hours later to get on a plane to go to Taipei or something. So keep that in mind as you balance all these five things. Um, so let me quickly recap and then we can go into Q&A. Uh, the, the things that I really want to stress today are don't follow the norm. Don't strive to be average. Don't just say, oh yeah, that's good enough if it matters to you. Take it to the extreme. Be an independent thinker guided by the wisdom of all your experiences uh, and do the right thing. Those are two things, right? Be an independent thinker, do the right thing. Always do the right thing. Because if you don't, you will regret it for the rest of your life. If you actually have some concern for humanity and other things, you will always have this little guilt in the back of your mind. Always do the right thing. You have to lead by example. Leading by example also means that your self has to be in good order in order for someone to be able to look up to you as a leader and for them to actually give them something worth following. And uh, something I already covered, but just want to re-emphasize. Moderation equals mediocre. Yes, some things you'll do in moderation, but the things that matter, take it to the breaking point push as hard and as close as to the limit as possible, and don't ever let up, and then of course be optimistic. So, any uh, questions or things? I covered a lot of stuff really quickly, I realized. And the other characteristic of a leader is your life is just an open book. Because if you try to say stuff like, well, that's none of your business, uh, stuff doesn't work well, and if you're high profile enough, and if that stuff is juicy, it'll end up in the newspaper, and that's not Good. So always be prepared to live your life as an open book, and in that spirit, I'll answer any question you have. Okay, who wants to start the question over here? We have microphones, so just let us know, and we'll aim it over and answer your question. Um, so I was wondering, what's one of the biggest lessons you've learned from your mistakes? A lot of lessons, a lot of mistakes. Um, you asked for the biggest lesson? Being college students should hear. I think if I could go back and do it all over again, um, I think I would have had a better view of the perspective. I wish I would have known this when I was at the University of Washington uh, in a fraternity, leading the Taekwondo club uh, of about 80 guys that showed up every Tuesday and Thursday, um, running a business out of my fraternity room um, as a physics major with three years of independent research under my belt. I thought I should be able to do everything always perfectly, blah, blah, blah. Um, I think I would have had a better balance approach, more of a conscientious decision of, okay, this week it's going to have to tilt this way or that way. So um, 
it really is keeping things in perspective. I've always fortunately been very optimistic about things, but really keeping perspective of what needs to happen and then keeping that balance uh, at play. Because I think I would have been, I, I think I would have enjoyed uh, the parties more if I could have truly said, hey, you know what? I'm going to focus on this for the next whatever hours or whatever. Or if I was to go and work out, I think I would have been able to really say, okay, decompression time. I need to do this, and I'm going to. And then literally, so it, it always felt like four, five, six other things were in the back of my mind as I'm trying to do this one thing. So it's really deliberately balancing and then pursuing that thing at that moment. What led to the change in your travel plans uh, or your level of travel throughout the year? And was that an issue of balance? Yeah, so let me give you perspective. Um, I forgot exact number, but I think if you circle the world, it's about 42,000 miles or something like that. I logged about 250 to 300,000 air miles every single year. Um, slept about 120 to 150 room nights at a hotel somewhere in the world. So that's what I consider a lot of travel. Um, so, <laughs> yeah, that's a lot of travel. You know, when, when you pull out, you know, your uh, wallet thing that's got all your, you know, status of, like and you can get upgrades in most airlines, then you know you've been traveling a lot and, and flight attendants start recognizing you. Um, so the big change happened, so great question by the way. So uh, in 2007, uh, I was uh, turning 40. And uh, as I was turning 40, for some reason I never felt old. You know, I felt really old when I turned 24, I don't know why. And then, you know, 30 was whatever, 35, yeah, whatever, and then 40 was, and not that I was feeling old, but it was like, that's kind of a big number. And, you know, it's like, okay, so I need to do something differently, I think. And um, I hate to read, but I read a lot because I know it's good for me. I launched my company when I was 27 years old, about to turn 28 within a few months. And one thing that I lacked was experience. You know, I just physically didn't have the numbers of hours logged in situations that all my competitors and everyone else I'm trying to you know, uh, work with or fight for, whatever I uh, have. So I read a lot. And in that process, I picked up a book called Halftime. And this book is about, uh, it, it's referring to halftime as in like a sporting game, right? You have halftime and it, it's basically talking about your life and saying, your game of it, treat your game for a moment, if you were to make an analogy, as a, as a game. and. The game isn't won in the first half, it's won or lost in the second half. And it was during that halftime that you're supposed to kind of do some reassessing and blah, 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 and then strategize and come out and do something. The other thing that was happening about that time frame was that, uh, um, and I have two boys that are uh, 14 and 16, um, and I was able to balance the family piece of it, you know, my relationship with my kids and my wife, by making sure that I was there at what I would call defining moments. Defining, you know, it, it's, um, and the way I worked it through in my mind and the way it worked out was um, I wasn't going to be there for every diaper change and the burping sessions and stuff like that. Uh, I think that's more for the parent than it is for the kid. And I did ask my kids if they remember and they don't, so that's a good thing. Uh, but it was those defining moments were becoming more frequent, you know during those times. And I also happened to be uh, reaching an age where it was kind of like, not that I was having a midlife crisis, but it felt like that kind of midlife time where I needed to do some assessing. And it was in my late 30s that I started uh, really thinking about it and reading the books. And I was in a very fortunate position where I could think about those things. And um, I did a lot of soul searching. Uh, the soul searching happened just like any other strategy over the Pacific, over the Atlantic, you know. And, JFK and Gloria and you got you know Chicago, the San Jose, the nerd bird as they call it, the you know, Oscar Airlines flight down to San Jose and all that stuff. And and I needed to come up with um, what's important to me. Uh, why am I here? Because I was in that fortunate position where I could just become a food processing pleasure seeking machine. And I knew that it had to be more than that. And I was able to articulate it in my very focused self um, and say that my uh, calling is to uh, is to cultivate next generation of leaders through education. 
which is one of the reasons why I'm very happy to be here tonight. Uh, it was at that time when I needed to make those changes. Fortunately, something else was happening. Uh, our company uh, hires people at the entry level and we groom them um, to be the top people because we have a very strong and very important, what we hold our culture to be very near and dear. And there were an increasing number of them that were really growing and doing super well and I wanted to give them the opportunity and they wanted the opportunity to run the business. So it was about that time frame that I appointed a president of the company and I took a back seat as the chairman and making all those changes. And that's why the travel changed. It wasn't that I said, I don't want to travel anymore, or there weren't opportunities to travel, there were a lot of opportunities to travel. Uh, so that's, that's a long-winded answer to that. It's kind of a whole package. I was going to ask that business is constantly changing. So for us, entry level workforce, what would you recommend that we look out for or know and read on so that we are kind of just ahead of everybody else? Excellent question. Um, so if I may uh, use you as a sp specific case study, can I do that? Yeah, I guess so. Uh, so fast forward and you're 30 years old. Just a quick image of who you are and what you think you're going to be doing. Fast forward again, you're 40 years old, kind of do a, you know, what do I live, what do I do, and what, who's my family and that kind of stuff, and do a 50, 60, 70, just for you know, as best as you can. And then based on all that stuff, and if you haven't quite done all that, which I don't expect you to have done, um, what would you like to do in life? I mean, what's important to you? What would you like to be when you're 30, 40 years old? I'd definitely like to be on a track of being a CEO of my own company or another company I've grown up with. So I definitely want to be able to retire at the age of 55. Why 55? I don't know, it's, it seems like a good age to where I'm still young enough to keep pushing, keep going, and I don't know, climb out and burst if I want to, and ski to before my body like, breaks down, so, I don't know. That's good, I like that. So you have specific goals in mind. So, you know, there's several things you should be really looking at, and choice of industry also has a lot to do with uh, kind of what kind of things that are important to you. Um, I didn't talk about very uh, much in detail about this portion, but when I was at the University of Washington, I was uh, majoring in physics, yet I was fortunate enough to have an opportunity to uh, start my own business, quote unquote, it was one man show out of a small room in Korea. Uh, I exported medical stuff, goods, to Korea through my family connections. And, you know, I'd go show up to my physics lab and do stuff, and then I'd go back, and, you know, late at night I could uh, work. Back then, fax was kind of how you work. Telephone, and you, uh, you know, take orders and you sell stuff, and this and that, because, you know, in Korea it's daytime when it's nighttime here. And, and in uh, one year, uh, I netted like $32,000 back in the late 80s, and it was like part time, and I do this, and this seems way more natural to me than nuclear physics. Uh, so it's like, wow, this is really cool. I, I think I could actually do this. And that's kind of how I started making the change. But then I did an evaluation. I said, OK, well, I need to make a transition from being a physics major who was going to go do research to some kind of business. And then I thought, OK, so I did this stuff that you're talking about, which is blah, 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 would be like this. And you know, I'm, I'm just as greedy, I think, as anyone else. Dr. Joseph was of some labor and this and that. And, um, I realized, given what I was given, my background, etc., and what I could consider to be my um, advantage and what have you, that high tech industry was where it was happening for that. Meaning, that's where a lot of money, a lot of excitement, and those kinds of things were. That doesn't mean you should all just go, you know, jump into high tech because it may not be the right thing for you. But these are the reasons why I went into it. Um, so. What high tech offered was uh, it, it's an industry that allows you to go, uh, frankly, make a lot of money and have a huge amount of successes, and they don't discriminate about age and stuff like that. And there's so many new things happening. It's you know you could uh, if you're uh, innovative enough, you can uh, write your own ticket, and that's why I got into high tech. Similarly, I would you know do some soul searching. Soul searching is really important, I think, and to really understand not only where you are but what you're given and then how you intend to use that fully and get you to where you want to be X number of years out. And it's never a stagnant number, it's you know, 10 years out and then you got to think of, okay, if I'm there, then I'm going to naturally end up over here. Is that okay? And if it is, then you go out and come do that. First and foremost, 
go get some internships. Right? That's nothing new, but it's like most people don't think about that. Because if you don't have internships and experience, you're not going to get in. And a lot of the times, you know, even if there's a higher inquiries at companies, um, interns being converted is considered internal hire, not an external hire. And don't be so caught up in one thing or another, but it, it, whatever industry it is and that, but think about your lifestyle and go after it that way. And I like your ambition in terms of, you know, you're wanting to be, your, uh, be a CEO, which is going to be, you know, my dad always told me, and he already said, this president's office is always the loneliest office. And talk to me about that when I was a kid. I'm like, this is office. I don't know, pretty cool. I like your office. You know, all these things. And I realized what, what he meant. You're usually the last guy out. You're the one who's making sure all the stuff is, you know, the lights are turned off and whatever, and you're always the one making sure that all things are done. And it's, it's usually the loneliest one. Uh, but as long as you're okay with all that, and you're willing to take that on, I think it makes a lot of sense. So, going back to like, the specific tactical things, make sure you go find an industry that you believe will help serve your needs, and then go after it with vigor and go grab some internships. And you know, UP's got huge amounts of support from all kinds of people. I mean, I'm on the board of Regents and gosh, I, I could guarantee you if you walked up to any person who was a Regent and you said, hey, Mr. So-and-so or Ms. So-and-so, I know you, can you uh, blah, 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 They're never gonna tell you, no. the reason they're here is to help. So I would take advantage of all of the resources that we as the university have including all the network uh, that we already have, as well as go get yourself an internship and go after it. It's never too early to do an internship. In fact, I would actually suggest if you have to slow your graduation time down, you know, delay it to grab a couple internships, that's more valuable. Good question. Yeah, I think that's a great question. You guys want to know about it doesn't have to be about business or anything. Thank you.